All right, good morning. Well, hey, my name is uh, Matt. I'm the youth pastor here at Renovation Church. And 18 of us just got back from Chicago. We were uh, on the northwest side of Chicago uh, for a mission trip. And we partnered with a church called uh, Starting Point Community Church. And this a small Latino church in uh, the belmont Cragen neighborhood in northwest Chicago. And we were there serving them, and they were sending us to do outreach uh, over the past week or so, and, and it was awesome. I mean, the, the church that we were at, the pastor, um, they do bilingual Spanish and English uh, messages, not just services where you might have like one person preaching and another person translating, like bilingual messages where he would start in Spanish, he would translate that part into English, he would continue in English, and then he would translate the next part in Spanish, and he did this for like... 45 minutes, and I can barely get one language out. So uh, it was very impressive. Um, but a couple of things that we did there, we were um, the church, small church. Like we got a big room in here and we're blessed. This church had like 15 to 20 people there on a Sunday morning, not including our team. Um, and they were putting up resources to house like 18 Venezuelan refugees who had basically just showed up and placed in a police station, and then the church welcomed them in to kind of help them get off their feet, find a job, move out on their own. Um, and we were able to meet them, ask them about their story, share what we believe, and it was, it was very awesome. And then one of the other things we did is we went to the police stations in, uh, kind of on the northwest side. Um, and at any of these police stations, there's anywhere between like a handful to 20 or 30 refugees that basically showed up, have nowhere to go, and so they're sleeping on the floor of this police station. And so we went to Walmart and we filled backpacks with basic personal hygiene products and, and gave it to them. And we were trying to talk. There was a huge language barrier, but able to talk and pray with them um, and just try to bless them in any way we can. And so it was exciting to see God move through our students. Um, a little bit, I was very proud, uh, especially thinking about just how God is going to use the next generation to complete and fulfill the great commission. And so if you're a middle or high school student, I said this last service, but I knew most of you guys would be in this one or the 1130. Um, if you're that age and you haven't come to Renovation Youth yet, come to fall kickoff in September and see what God is doing. It's going to be great. So, all right, we are in week four of our summer series through the book of Zechariah. And just kind of a warning this morning, the passage we're going through is difficult. Uh, it is confusing, um, but we're going to jump in and, and do what we can. And so go ahead and grab a Bible. Um, oh, also quick, um, I know uh, Grant m mentioned this, but you will really want the Renovation Church app because in kind of the weekly verses area, there's going to be a link to an image that will help explain the vision that we're going to look at. So download the Renovation Church app, download it, go to summer services at the bottom, and then you're going to see a golden lampstand near the bottom of the page, and uh, that's where we'll be. But I'll kind of tell you we when we can... Um, get there. So uh, to catch everyone up to speed so far, the book of Zechariah is the second to last book in the Old Testament. And it, it's written to the small remnants of the tribe of Judah who is returning from exile in Babylon and they're returning Jeru to, to Jerusalem. And so in Zechariah, we have a series of messages and visions given to this prophet to then give to the returning people of Judah. And so if you've missed any of the previous uh, weeks so far, we're doing a chapter a week, then you can go watch them on YouTube or the Renovation Church app or website. Um, they're awesome. And so uh, this morning we're looking at the prophecy of the lampstand and the olive trees. And like I said, it's a confusing one. Uh, some of the interpretation has confused or, or perplexed scholars, um, but we're going to get through it. So uh, grab your Bibles, turn to Zechariah chapter 4. And we're going to start all the way in the beginning in verse 1. It says this, Then the angel who talked with me returned and woke me up, like someone awakened from sleep. He asked me, What do you see? I answered, I see a sol solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it, with seven channels to the lamps. Also, there are two olive trees, olive trees by it, one on the right and one on the left of the bowl. I asked the angel who talked with me, What are these, my lord? He answered, Do you not know what these are? No, my lord, I replied. And so Zechariah is receiving this vision from this angel of God, and it says that the angel woke him up. And I know all the parents of teenagers at the very, very beginning are going, Yep, I know what this angel's going through. Yep, these, hard to get these kids up. I don't think he was a kid, but 
Okay, now if you have the app, you're going to want to pull it up. Um, Summer Service is at the bottom, and then Golden Lampstand, and it'll bring you to uh, a page on our website, and it should have an image of this prophecy that we're looking at. And so in this vision that the angel uh, gives to Zechariah, he sees this lampstand, like a, a menorah, a, a lampstand with seven lamps on it, and then you have two olive trees on either side of this lamp. And then at the top of the lampstand, you have this bowl, and then you have other channels, and it's a little confusing. And so just kind of a note, that image that you're looking at is not scripture, um, but it's trying to be a faithful representation of what Zechariah could have seen in this vision so we can understand it a little more. And so it's a lot, but regardless of exactly how it looked, as you can see on that image, Here's kind of the point of this vision, the point of the lampstand and the olive trees and the channels and the bowl and the oil and everything. So the lampstand, in all of its complexity, and is an image given to Zechariah as an encouragement to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And so uh, if we look at other um, worship centers in the Old Testament, like the tabernacle or Solomon's temple, they had a, a, a physical golden lampstand in it. And it, the, the, the priests would keep it uh, lit at all times. And the goal was that this, or the, the, the picture that this presented was God always dwelling with his people, his perpetual dwelling with the nation of Israel, which, by the way, is kind of a, a little nod to Jesus, right? Emmanuel, God with us, and then at his second coming, we'll be with him um, forever. That's kind of a cool uh, nod to Jesus. But so the, 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 the prophecy, this vision is an encouragement. Hey, Zerubbabel, rebuild the temple because the, the temple was destroyed about 70 years ago after the people of Judah and Israel were sent into exile. And so this whole time, while, Israel, while the people of Judah are in Babylon, they're in exile, God has desired to dwell with his people. And now he's calling them back to Jerusalem to reestablish the kingdom of Judah, to reestablish the temple so that God could be with them. And so we see that God desires to dwell with his people, and he's commanding them to, to rebuild the temple. And if we kind of think or put ourselves in their shoes, that they're returning, many of them have never seen Jerusalem, and if they have, they're very, very old, not of working age. And they get back to Jerusalem, and they see this pile of rubble. This mountain of rubble where the temple used to be, right? A harder project than just starting from scratch. And they're like, we don't even have a wall set up yet. We don't have a military yet. Like, it is illogical for us to put all of our resources into rebuilding this temple. But God tells them to build it anyway, and he says that he's going to be with them. So uh, grab your Bible again. We're going to skip down to verse 11, where the angel uh, continues to explain this prophecy or this vision to um, Zechariah. It says this, Then I asked the angel, What are these two olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? Again, I asked him, What are these two olive branches beside the two gold pipes that pour out golden oil? He replied, Do you not know what these are? No, my lord, I said. So he said, These are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. And so, if you remember from the first passage, right? The, these two olive trees are on either side of this lampstand. And it, verse 12 says that they're, they're to pour out golden oil, right? These, these, these candles or these lamps needed oil to always stay on, to perpetually light. And so God is basically saying that these two olive trees, they're people, they symbolize people. The first one is they symbolize the priest Joshua, who we talked about last week. And the second tree is Zerubbabel, right? They didn't have a king, they, but they had more of like a governor leader. And so Zerubbabel is that leader. And so God has specifically chosen or anointed these two leaders to lead Judah religiously and politically. And now if we kind of think back to the history of the nation of Israel in the Bible, we have, um, we have the King Saul, then we have King David, and then we have his son Solomon. And then after King Solomon, the nation of Israel split into two. So you have the northern kingdom of Israel, uh, which comprised ten tribes of Israel. And then we had the southern kingdom of Judah, which uh, comprised of the tribe of Judah and the tribe of, ben of Benjamin. And all of the, the, the northern kingdom, or all the northern kingdom's kings were evil. They were all evil. And most of the southern kingdom of Judah's kings 
were evil. And bad kings, bad leadership that led to a corrupt people and a corrupt, a corrupt government and priesthood. And so finally, God had so much patience, but finally in discipline, God kicked them out of the land. But now that he's starting to welcome some of the tribe of Judah back, he's saying, hey, I'm providing you good leaders. The, these good leaders, Zerubbabel and Joshua, they're going to provide you the oil that you need to shine God's light to your neighbors and to the world. God is calling them to be that light, and he's providing them with good leadership. And so, in chapter 4 here, we kind of have this weird structure. So at the beginning, we have verses 1 to 5, and at the end, we have verses 11 to 14, and they kind of act as um, an explanation of this vision that Zechariah is seeing. And what we'll do is we're going to call this a prophetic sandwich. And so in order to make a sandwich, you've got to lay down the bread first, right? So verses 1 to 5, verses 11 to 14, that's the bread. But the good stuff, like the meat and cheese, the meaning and the application, is found in the middle portion, verses 6 to 10. And so in this prophetic sandwich, we're going to see, or we're going to go now to the middle part. And if you're, uh, if you're vegan, these middle verses are your hummus and your lettuce on your sandwich. And so go ahead and open back up to verse 6, and now we're going to kind of go back in this passage, and just kind of a warning, this is a little confusing, because as a way for the angel of God to explain this vision to Zechariah, he explains it by giving messages to Zerubbabel. So, just kind of a heads up, that's, it's, a, it's a little wonky all over the place. So, all right, let's pick up verse 6, and it says this, so he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. What are you mighty mountain, right, this pile of rubble before Zerubbabel? You will become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone to shouts of God bless it, God bless it. And so that leads us now to our, our main point this morning. We have two main points. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. And also, I got to tell you guys, I had an awesome joke if we were outside because we don't have like screens to put our main points on. I was asked David, you know, hey, can we get like good year blimps to have like the main point behind it? And it's like flying behind the stage as we're up here. But apparently we don't have budget for that. And so at the annual meeting today, vote for good year blimps. That's what we're going to do for the rest of the summer. All right. First of two main points this morning is this. We can't accomplish anything of spiritual significance apart from the Holy Spirit. We can't accomplish anything of spiritual significance apart from the Holy Spirit. So God is giving this command, this encouragement to Zerubbabel to rebuild the temple, to rebuild this lampstand that will produce light for the world to see God's goodness. He's saying, hey, don't rely on your own strength. Don't rely on your own wisdom or intellect, but instead rely on the Spirit. The Holy Spirit will provide what Zerubbabel and Judah need to rebuild the temple. And without God's Spirit, they're not going to be able to do it. And so when we kind of zoom out and think about our own lives, the Holy Spirit is the one who kind of indwells us after we put our faith in Jesus and empowers us to live for God, empowers us to obey what God has commanded us to do. Now, that doesn't mean that we never sin. That doesn't mean that every earthly project is guaranteed success. But what it does mean is that we are given the Holy Spirit to lead us closer to Jesus, to lead us deeper into spiritual maturity and deeper in a love and our love and connection to God, right? The Holy Spirit enables us to live for Him. And so when we think about this pile of rubble, where the temple used to be, this mountain of rubble as the text describes, what is that mountain or that obstacle in your life right now that seems like a mountain that you've been trying to overcome on your own strength? You know, maybe it's uh, at your job and there's a project at work and it seems like this mountain of rubble and you've been trying to conquer it by your own strength, your own intellect, your own resources, your own expertise, but you haven't brought it before the Lord. You haven't asked for him to provide his spirit and his wisdom and his strength to allow you to overcome that obstacle. Maybe you have an adult child who's wandered from the faith that you tried to raise them with, and it seems like a mountain in front of you, a mountain of rubble, just to have basic spiritual conversations, basic conversations with them 
about Jesus? What is it in your life that you need to stop relying on your own strength for and instead rely on the Spirit? Uh, my, uh, my house leader, my house group leader, um, and his family recently went through something that seemed like a mountain of rubble in front of them that they didn't know how they were going to get through. Uh, their only child, their four-year-old girl, um, had some problems breathing. And so they brought her to the doctor, and after some evaluations, they, they found like this golf ball-sized um, mass on her uh, tonsils. And so the next day, they operated on, her, uh, on it. They, they took it out. But the doctor came to them and said very confidently that they believe it's lymphoma. And so I have some words from an email Jake sent me uh, outlining what he was going through his head uh, when he heard that, that potential diagnosis. And as they were waiting for the test to come back for many, many days, um, this is how he viewed this mountain of rubble in front of him. So I'm just going to read from this. When the surgeon came out and told us the mass was successfully removed, but he was very confident it was lymphoma, I lost it. At first I was sad and fearful of losing our only daughter, the one God graciously blessed us with after two miscarriages. And this fear drove me to read and research and prepare and seek medical advice from all the best doctors I knew in the world. I spent hours in the middle of the night when I was supposed to be resting and relying on God, relying on my own smarts, my own hard work, my own connections to prepare for the battle of my life to protect my beautiful daughter. As the days went on, I was angry that God was in control and not me, that in his sovereignty he could potentially allow cancer and death to take my baby girl at only four years old. I know sickness and death is not in his will, but that he may allow it and use the pain for something far greater in the light of eternity. Selfishly, though, I did not want to endure this, but I painfully surrendered. I feel like that's an amazing way to put it. When we think about relying on our own strength and, and trying to rely on God's strength, it's, it's a painful surrender. It's not an easy thing to do. But I painfully surrender to the truth that God is in control and I can choose joy in all circumstances because he is a good God who loves his children more than I could ever love my baby girl. And so, thankfully, you know, it was supposed to be a 48-hour turnaround on the test. It took multiple days after that, but thankfully, the test came back negative, um, and she is clear of lymphoma. And we praise God for that. Amen. But, but what a trial. What a hard thing to look at, this mountain of rubble in front of them, thinking, God, what are you going to do with this? And painfully surrendering our own, our over self-reliance on ourselves over to God. And so what is the mountain in your life that you have been relying on your own strength for, that you need to rely on God's spirit for? And you know, I can't promise that he's going to fix everything in your life. In fact, Jesus promises his people some level of hardship on this side of heaven. And we don't know what God is going to do, but the Bible promises that the spirit is with you as a comforter. And in your trials, God will bring you closer to himself as you yield your own reliance uh, on, on yourself up to him. And you painfully surrender to relying on him. So what is that mountain in your life? Let's go back to the, the word. We're going to finish up this prophetic sandwich by looking at verse 8. And it says this, Then the word of the Lord came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple, his hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Verse 10, who dares despise the day of small things? Since the seven eyes of the Lord that range throughout the earth will rejoice when they see the chosen capstone in the hands of Zerubbabel. All right, our second main point is this, this morning. When God accomplishes something, he alone gets the glory. When God accomplishes something, he alone gets the glory. Right? Zerubbabel and his men could not finish the temple on their own strength. God, gives, God sends his spirit to empower them, to enable them, to give them the strength and wisdom to accomplish this task. And so it's obvious, right? When, when they can't do it on their own and God sends his spirit and enables it to happen, who gets the glory? Who gets the honor? God. He alone gets the glory. For that, the end of verse 9 says, Then you will know 
that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Zerubbabel can't take credit for it. The men of Judah can't take credit for it. Only God can take credit for it. And we also see, too, that God uses small things, small beginnings, like looking at a field or a mountain of rubble where you're supposed to build a temple. Right? How, is, how is God going to make anything out of this, this small thing, this small beginning? But he does. And he accomplishes something amazing out of the rubble, which is the reconstruction of the temple. And so maybe there's something in your life right now that's small and you're, and you're just not sure how God is going to use it. You know, maybe you're five days sober from alcohol or five days sober from viewing pornography and you're not sure if God can continue that on, that small thing, that small beginning. You know, maybe you're thinking about sharing the gospel with a friend and it, it feels like you're looking at a pile of rubble. Like, God, how are you going to use this friendship? This person seems so far gone. But God is asking us to trust him, to rely on his spirit and not on our own strength, and that he will get the glory when he accomplishes his work. And, you know, we, we kind of see this idea all over the Bible, right? God uses small things, small beginnings for his redemptive plan, his purposes, you know, one of, the, one of God's favorite small things to use are babies, right? What's more small and insignificant than a baby who can't take care of itself for years, right? Fully and completely reliant on its caretakers. Now, I, I'm about to learn about this. I know nothing right now, but we're having our first baby in October, and so I should probably learn. Uh, actually, also, if you look at the app at the bottom, it should have our baby registry. And so if you guys want to take a look, <laughs> I'm kidding. That would be a good idea, though. So... So babies, they're so seemingly small and insignificant, yet God has used them throughout the Bible for his glory and his plan, right? The verse 10 says not to despise the day of small things, right? We think back to Abraham, right? The promised baby of Isaac. They tried to conceive for their whole lives, and it just didn't happen until God made a way. And then that baby led to the, the patriarchs, and then to the nation of Israel, and then to Jesus, Think about another baby of Moses who was, was almost killed, but God providentially allowed him to, I always picture it, the, the movie The Prince of Egypt with the alligator snapping at him, right? Moving down the river and Pharaoh's daughter takes him and raises him and he ends up leading Israel. God uses him to lead Israel out of Egyptian captivity, right? But then the best baby of them all was Jesus. God himself, fully man, fully God, Right? He wasn't set down on a chariot. He wasn't born in a palace. He was born in a barn, into poverty. Why? Because God uses small things for his glory. Right? And that baby grew up, and he never sinned, and he fulfilled the law. He kept the law. And, but instead of being crowned the rightful ruler of Judah, they kicked him out of town and murdered him in the most brutal fashion known in the first century, crucifixion. But when he died, he died as the spotless white lamb of God in our place. In my place with my sins and in your place with your sins. And he died and he paid for it. Right, and then three days later, he rose from the dead, defeating sin and death, and now he's sitting and reigning at the right hand of the Father over life itself. And so I feel like in a, in a room this large, there, there's got to be some of us that need to submit to that king this morning. You know, maybe you've been like Zerubbabel. And, and you know you've got a problem. You know things are not right in your life. And so you've, you've been trying to make it right on your own. You've been trying to be, be better or do better or fix your life. But you just keep returning to whatever's ensnaring you. Whatever sin is holding you captive. Right? And so we need the Spirit of God provided through the, the forgiveness and blood of Jesus to enable us to live for God. And you can have that. You can have the spirit that's talked about here in Zechariah in chapter 4 that enables us to live for God, that enables us to do things of spiritual significance. And so if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, then turn off of that road of sin and turn away from your old life, your old sin, and put your faith in Jesus. And he's going to save you. He's going to give you his spirit and he's going to lead you in his ways. 
And if you do that this morning, in the quiet of your own heart, where you're sitting, I want to talk to you after the service. We're going to go into another song, and then David's going to come back really briefly. But after the service, I'm going to be off to the side over there with our follow-up team. And if that's you, you need someone to disciple you. They need someone to walk with you on this road and this journey, an amazing journey, but a difficult one of following Jesus. And we would love to connect with you about that. So don't be shy of me. Come talk to me after uh, the service over there. All right? Let's pray. God, we hand over our obstacles to you. And Lord, we, we pray that whatever it is in our lives that we're relying on our own strength for, that we would hand it over to you, that you would provide the strength and the wisdom of your spirit, and that whatever you're calling us to in our lives, that the small things, the, the obstacles, Lord, whatever it might be, if we conquer them by the power of your spirit, that you alone would get the glory and that your name would be made great because of how you work in our lives. And it's in Jesus' holy name that we pray. Amen.